Okay, welcome back. I'm going to call back the Human Services Finance and Policy to order. Um, members, really appreciate um, you allowing everyone to have a bit of a break. I just want the public to be aware that our staff, nonpartisan and partisan staff, have been working nonstop on our omnibus bills. And of course, the HHS bill is rather large and very complex, and they've gotten very little sleep. So I hope you will recognize their work somehow and thank them for all of their dedication and devotion to the people of Minnesota. The next item on our agenda is that we have, now remember we have the omnibus DE in front of us and I'm going to um, um, move to amend this DE with my authors um, and the DE is titled A22-0415. I'm going to amend that and offer the A5. So I will move the A5 amendment to the DE amendment and offer discussion. I know Representative Albright. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would move uh, to divide the A5. Okay, Representative Albright, I want you to go very slowly so everyone can follow uh, your motion to divide the A5 amendment. Certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, Please proceed. The motion, the motion is to divide the H4579A5 amendment, divide it before line 2.5 and after line 2.11 and before line 6.16 and after line 6.29 and motion to vote on those sections together and I would request a roll call. Okay, Representative Albright. So are there, is this correct that there are, would be five sections of the A5 amendment to vote on? Madam Chair, the first vote that would make appropriate sense would be on the sections between 2.5 and 2.11, including then line 6.16 through 6.29 just those two sections. Okay, we're gonna find out if this is possible, but first I'll take comments from members. Chair Liebling. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. That was just my question. I mean, I know we can divide amendments and so on, but I've never seen that we would take two chunks of an amendment and vote on them together. I've just never seen that at all. So I think we might need perhaps some advice from nonpartisan staff. Normally when, these things happen on the floor. We have the chief clerk and the chief clerk gives us an opinion and then we all know that that's the definitive answer. But since we're not on the floor, I think we need to see if that is permissible. That's just, thank you. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Let's see, we'll have Daniel Pinelli, our nonpartisan research staff, um, provide us uh, input on this uh, potential division of the A5 amendment. Ms. Pinelli? Hi, Madam Chair. Um, I think the chair can allow such a motion if it's clear to the committee what what's included in the amendment and if it can be clearly described. So in this instance, I think what Representative Albright is asking is for lines 2.5 to 2.11 and lines 6.16 to 6.29 to be voted on together. And I believe that all of those lines are related to removing sections from the bill that are related to the disability waiver rate system. Ms. Pinelli, do, when we have um, a division, do those pieces have to be together and can they stand alone? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't think those pieces need to be together. Um, and as far as standing alone, do you mean if we voted on that, or if the committee voted on that, <clears throat> would the rest of the amendment be able to stand alone? Uh, Chair, or Chair Pinto. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, I think that Mr. McCormick may actually be watching this and may be able to provide assistance to us. Um, I don't know if he's actually on, but I think he may be watching. I was just trying to reach out to him. I, I agree with Chair Liebling. I've, I don't think in, in all my time in the legislature I've ever seen in a division that you could vote on two pieces combined. But it does seem like maybe the first question is, could the five different pieces that are being suggested, each one has to be able to stand on their own. Um, and so, uh, uh, but in any case, um, so I guess I, I, I have never seen that and, and um, I really don't think that that's something that can be done. You could have two pieces being voted on at the same time. It has to be that each one of these five pieces can entirely stand on their own. Um, and that may be something Ms. Pinelli can first help us. Could, could each one of these separate pieces stand on their own? Thank you, no, thank you Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Pinto. Ms. Punelli, would you like us to get advice from Patrick McCormick, or would you? Do you? Are you comfortable commenting on whether each of the five sections can stand alone? Um, Madam Chair, I think each of the five sections, apart from those two sections that are related to DWRS, are all amending different parts of the bill and probably could stand, each one could stand alone. The two DWRS pieces um, are related to House File 3100, which is a package of sections that are all related to the disability waiver rate system. If you, if the committee went ahead with only one of those two pieces, then you'd be amending parts of disability waiver rate system, but you wouldn't be including that entire package. So I don't know if that would be able to stand alone or not. I think it probably would, but. But they have an effective date that could complicate it is my understanding that may not be be able to stand alone. Um, let's see, hold on a second. Madam Chair, I think I think what the issue would be is that you would be you would be making changes to some of the DWRS services um, and not others so that the changes wouldn't be consistent throughout. Chair Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess, I mean, it, um, it's my understanding, and again, um, and if, um, it's my understanding that each one of these sections has to be able to stand on their own and receive a vote, a separate vote on their own. It is not possible to combine two sections. I, I, it sounds from Ms. Pinelli, Madam Chair, that in fact, these two sections, one on page two and one on page six, cannot be voted on on their own. They don't, they don't stand on their own. I would assume that's why um, Lee Albright is wanting to combine them. It's just that that is not something that is possible under our rules. I've never seen that, and I, I don't know if anybody can point to an example. Um, you can't take a piece from one section and combine it with a piece from another, and then they can stand together. They each have to be able to stand um, separately, and it doesn't sound like that's the case in this situation. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Madam Represent Chair. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, We are not creating five different sections. Uh, we are carving out two sections, uh, first on page two, and then again on page six. Those two sections specifically, and the remainder of the bill would stand on its own. To Representative Pinto's point, uh, I, I would respectfully disagree with his point that both sections that I am speaking to can stand on their own. And if you would prefer, uh, I can certainly uh, amend my motion to take each one of them separately, but for convenience sake, because they both relate to DWRS uh, and the removal of that language, uh, I've chosen to include both of those in the amendment, but I'm happy to amend to take each one of them separately. But uh, based upon our read and our uh, uh, concurrence with uh, nonpartisan research, uh, both of those sections will stand on their own merits and do not jeopardize uh, the integrity of the remainder of the sections of the bill, of the amendment. Any other advice from members? Chair Pinto. 
So thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll just note, I'm, there's not a comment on the substance. Uh, and if in fact, each of the sections can stand on their own, then, then my sort of process objection would, would go away. And I, I can't comment on that. Um, obviously, Ms. Pinelli and, um, is the expert on that. And it sounds like Reed Albright is arguing that they could stand separately. And so I'll just say my concern was combining two sections from two different parts of the bill. Thanks. I agree. I'm not comfortable combining sections and voting on them, Representative Albright. That could set a very bad precedence in committees. Uh, Vice Chair Bonner. Um, also, Madam Chair, and maybe the, uh, we could have House staff mention this, but I, I think um, I believe some of these sections were tied to the competitive workforce factor, and I'm curious how that would interplay with the division. And if that would create an issue with the division. Representative Albright. Uh, Chair Schultz, I would defer to uh, Ms. Pinelli and other counsel on that uh, if they have understanding of those provisions. Ms. Pinelli. Madam Chair, members, the competitive workforce factor is part of this package. I believe all of those sections related to the competitive workforce factor are in the, the language that we're talking about that's on page six. Um, and I don't know if this is helpful at all for the committee, but the reason why the DWRS language is set is sort of separated and is in two separate parts of the amendment is because the sections within the bill although they're in the same article, they're not all right next to each other, in part because of the recod that was passed. So some of the language is amending statute and some of it is amending session laws. Vice Chair Bonner. Thank you. So we don't actually know what effect the division would have on the rate factor. I think that's correct. So, um, Representative Albright, we have a hard stop at noon. I, I as the chair, uh, because you can vote yes and no up or down on the total amendment. I am. I really uh, prefer not to divide this and combine sections. I don't want to set a, a precedence for other committees to take sections, put them together, and vote on them. This is already a secondary amendment. Um, so I. I prefer as chair that we, we we vote up or down on the entire package of the A5 amendment. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, uh, it certainly is within the purview of the chair and your discretion not to divide the amendment. And we would certainly be respectful of your discretion in that, uh, in that venue. Uh, that being said, uh, Madam Chair, I would amend uh, my motion to divide out just lines 6.16 through line 6.29 and request a roll call on that as the division of the amendment. Representative Albright, that's very similar to your first motion. So I'm... Madam Chair, respectfully, I am only placing one section and dividing that out as opposed to, as Ms. Pinelli and others have articulated, the concerns that are possible uh, for the interaction between those two, although I respectfully disagree with it. And so in light of that, I am simplifying my division to only include lines 6.16 through 6.29, which is, I believe, germane to a normative division uh, as you might have seen in committee before in a number of instances or on the House floor. Chair Liebling. Oh, Madam Chair, the, the question always on a division is whether the parts can stand on their own. And I think that what we just heard is that they can't. And it's rather ironic that it, it's probably because of the recodification. If these two sections were actually together in the bill and you could cleanly cut one off from the other, then it, you know, it may be a different story. But I think that what we're hearing here is that the division is out of order because you, you don't have a section that can stand on its own. Uh, 
So I would just uh, ask you to find the division out of order. Madam Chair, closing comment. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, uh, with all due respect, Chair Liebling, I would disagree. Uh, as you've said, as as we've heard from uh, nonpartisan staff, uh, their assertion is that both uh, sections that I have called out in the division motion uh, can stand on their own. It is also true that the chair has the discretion to refuse that division. Unfortunately, uh, this comes at a cost uh, to the very people that in spoken word from the testifiers that we've heard this morning, as well as from uh, both chairs, healthcare is in a crisis and, and is struggling to provide uh, living wages, as well as uh, competitive wages for the people that serve uh, the most vulnerable amongst us. I can see no reason why we would not want to include in this amendment the partitions that would effectively agree with those sentiments and improve their wages. By removing them, you are basically saying that their wages are less important than others, and I take exception with that. And so that's why I have moved in a motion to divide those out to articulate that point specifically. And so with that, Madam Chair, I will leave it up to you to decide at the chair's discretion how you wish to dispense with my motion. Thank you, Representative Albright. Let's hear from Representative Keel, and I'm going to rule on this uh, motion to divide. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I appreciate the discussion. Would Is it possible to have Ms. Spinelli uh, explain to us uh, whether or not this, this uh, uh, Amendment can stand on its own. I think we are going to, I'm going to rule this uh, division out of order because they're not joined together. And I don't want to set a bad precedence uh, because these sections are separated in the bill. It doesn't mean, I mean, and also, honestly, um, this is, I believe, politically motivated. And I'm going to just uh, restate evidence, facts for the public. Last year and previous to that, I worked and my caucus worked to in include a competitive workforce factor. We could not call it inflation because the federal government would not allow us to do that. We increased reimbursement rates in the DWS. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars in that. We increased the time that the, that, um, the DWRS system reimbursement rates would go up last year. We invested in DWRS. Many of my Republican colleagues voted no on those investments in previous years. Our caucus is committed to increasing reimbursement rates. We want to make sure those reimbursement rates increases go to wages and benefits for those doing the work of caring for our most vulnerable population. So that is a fact that I make that perfectly clear. We are also committed to increasing reimbursement rates for PCAs, wages that have not gone up, but are tied, when those reimbursement rates goes up, are tied to wages in statute. We are committed to increasing the elderly waiver reimbursement rates so people doing that work can have higher wages. We have limited budgets here. There are significant needs. We are aware of that. It is very tough to have to prioritize, very difficult. We won't have to if you can convince your colleagues in the Senate to increase the total budget and meet the needs of all Minnesotans by improving these reimbursement rates. And I am committed to making sure that I will advocate, my team will advocate to make sure we get a larger budget on the GOP Senate. I could use your help with that representatives. So my, I'm going to rule that um, we are not going to divide the amendment. I'm going to rule that out of order. And we are going to proceed to take comments on the overall A5 amendment and then uh, vote on the A5 amendment. So comments related to not the division, but to the A5 amendment are allowed at this time. Madam Chair. We have Representative Robbins first, Representative Albright. Representative Robbins. 
We are not hearing you, Representative Robbins. Well, we have technical difficulties with Representative Rams. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, respectfully, I understand that the Chair's discretion is um, broad and uh, certainly uh, attempted to accommodate the concerns of uh, different parts uh, within the amendment to accommodate the concerns. But that, with that being said, Madam Chair, with those two partitions still included in it. Um, it's, it's disappointing, uh, certainly not, uh, as you say, uh, um, stating motives would probably rise to the concern that I would have in terms of your assertion that this is political. Um, we're just trying to uh, look out for those that have specifically stated that there are needs and we're trying to address those uh, by our actions within this amendment. Uh, that being said, members, uh, this amendment does not address what we've heard yet this morning in countless uh, testimonials from uh, our testifiers. And so with that, I would urge members uh, to vote no on the amendment for adoption. Thank you, Representative Albright. I'm just please, I just encourage the public to look at our votes and how we vote in the past and in the present and how much we are spending in the house to meet the needs of older adults and people with disabilities. We are making significant investments in wages in creating a pipeline for caring professionals. So many good things are in this bill. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would request a roll call vote on this amendment. Thank you. Roll call. We will take a roll call. Uh, let's see, Chair Liebling. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if uh, if Representative Robbins can get unmuted now. Maybe we should let her go first and okay, try again. Okay, Representative Robbins, can you try again? We were not able to hear you even when you were unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for the difficulty. And I will respect um, your request not to belabor this, but I have to say it's incredibly frustrating that you ruled before we heard from Ms. Pinelli about whether this could stand on its own. I, I feel like we are being silenced and not following procedure. And I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Robbins. I try to all year I have been running a very fair committee, giving everybody a voice. I want us to be continue to be civil and not be political in this committee because of the area that we address in our jurisdiction. I want to avoid the politics and the theater in this committee. I want to do good work for the people. We all do. And that's what we are trying to do. Chair Lee Blaine. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just um, wanted to say, first of all, I think, uh, I'm, well, I'm not going to talk about the division decision. I think the chair is correct there. And I think we did hear from Ms. Pugnelli on that point. What I really would like to say, though, too, is that my understanding of what we're doing in the amendment is trying to reconcile with the spreadsheet. And everyone should understand that the bill, it is a large bill. We heard a lot of positive testimony this morning, people who love the investments in the bill. Obviously, it doesn't do enough for everyone, and um, we all wish that we could do. We are, um, but w I just want to say everyone should understand that a huge bill like this is a work in progress. This is not, uh, the, the amendment before us is just trying to reconcile the language to the spreadsheet, but this does not mean that we aren't still interested in continuing to try to raise those wages. We all are. And we're going to continue to look for resources and push for resources to be able to do that because we do hear how important it is. We all want to live in a state where every vulnerable, pers vulnerable person gets their needs met. I think we all join in that. And as the chair has said, it's really a matter of how we prioritize. We, we cannot, you know, at, so far... We have not been given the resources to meet all the needs that we would like to meet. And I've been in this body for now almost 18 years, and I have never seen a year when we've been able to meet 
a couple years when we've been able to meet as many needs as we have, but there's always, always something left undone. Um, so this bill is a work in progress. I don't want anyone to think that we are not interested in meeting every single need that we have heard. We certainly are. And as the bill moves to ways and means, we intend to keep trying to work to figure out this really complicated puzzle of how do we, how do we meet everybody's needs? That is really our goal. So I really appreciate the chair working on, as I've been mostly busy on the other half of the puzzle, um, she's done incredible work and the members of this committee have done amazing work to try to figure this out. But I, I just wanna say to everyone, this is a work in progress. This is not um, you know, a, a commentary on not wanting to meet any of these needs because we really do hear you. So thank you, we, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Liebling. And I will just add, um, the, the expense of the DWRS system, whenever we do a reimbursement rate, we have spending in the current biennium, and then we have to account for spending in the tails because as a state, we have to balance the budget. The DWRS reimbursement rate could, could cost 150 million in the, in the next biennium and double that or more in the tails. So I urge everyone testifying today, everyone who cares about increasing these reimbursement rates to beg for a larger budget for HHS in the Senate. We are bringing forward over $700 million in just the biennium in this budget and over 1.2 billion in the tails. We need as a state to be responsible for caring for people. That means we need new revenue to meet these needs. I need help, we need help advocating for new revenue to meet the needs of Minnesotans, as you heard from the incredible testimony we hear every day in this committee. That's what we need. We need to prioritize people. We need to prioritize people of Minnesota. Representative Muller. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And just to piggyback on that, when folks are reaching out and saying, we need more money to do this, that also means that we're not giving tax cuts to the wealthiest people and to large businesses. These are the kinds of people that we need to invest in. Many of us are um, authors and co-authors of the DWRS bill. We strongly believe in it. And we're talking about using money to help people in that way, as opposed to the wealthiest Minnesotans. And so that message needs to be made loud and clear um, to the other body as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Moeller. And like I always say, when we invest in our people, we all do better. When we invest in people, we all do better. And I hope that we all can make that a priority this session and make these critical investments. Representative Rasmussen, and then we're gonna go to a vote after Rep Representative Matt Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out to committee members that you know, we're not in a conference committee yet. And it's my understanding that, you know, that the House and this committee can do what we want to do, including funding DWRS. And um, it's also my understanding that we don't have a budget target yet. And so this is something that we could do in this committee today. We are not yet in conference with the Senate. So just wanted to make sure that members of this committee were aware and that members of the public were aware. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Rasmus, and I appreciate your comment. Uh, we, um, we will get a budget resolution. And I urge, this is why I'm urging the public to really reach out to make sure uh, we have adequate funding to meet the needs. So we will get that and um, we will have to work within the con confines of that budget resolution. Okay, with that members, Ms. Hansen, please um, call the roll and I will remind members we are voting on the A5 amendment to the DE um, to adopt this amendment. The chair votes aye. Schultz, aye. Vice Chair Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright? Albright, no. Albright, no. Representative Bolden? Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle? Burkle, no. Burkle, no. Representative Fisher? Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen? Hansen, aye. 
Hans and I. Thank you. Representative Keel? Keel, no. Keel, no. Representative Liebling? Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Moeller? Moeller, aye. Moeller, aye. Representative Noor? No, aye. Noor, aye. Thank you. Representative Novotny? Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Pearson? Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, no. Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins? No. Robbins, no. Representative Sandell? Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. And Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Chair Schultz at 16. Or I'm sorry. 11 ayes and 8 nays. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Thank you, members. The motion prevails and the 8 5 amendment is adopted to the DE. Okay, the next amendment we have is the A4 amendment. Representative Keel, would you like to offer your A4 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would. Like okay, Representative Keel moves the A4 amendment. Please explain your amendment, Representative Keel. Um, members, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, the A4 bill is uh, what we heard uh, this year uh, to help our long-term care providers address the critical staffing shortages with permanent solutions. As a reminder, 15 nursing homes have closed since 2019 and four since January of this year. So 23,000 vacant positions across long-term care with 1 million seniors in the state. So our nursing homes are on the verge of collapse. Uh, we actually have one in our district that I is hanging on by a thread. Um, I'm not even sure it's that close. But anyway, while critical shortages in staff are occurring statewide, it's especially troubling that our rural communities, where we are in danger of having entire counties without a nursing home, we if we don't do something now. So my if, um, I would be shocked if there was anyone in this on this committee who hasn't heard from some nursing home um, or provider for this very serious call for help. This amendment uh, members would add more wage costs to the facility specific cost based portion of the rate and will allow nursing facilities to make needed investments in wages for staff areas like dietary, laundry, housekeeping and plant operations. It applies to known cost fact change factor to nursing home rates to mitigate the effects of the 21 month delay under our current payment system. This will allow nursing homes to pay payment to be more accurately reflective in the current level of things, cost for things like staffing, food and utilities, which I'm guessing are rapidly going up. So, um, and then it for, for fully converts the 2017 rate system for elderly waiver program which provides the variety of services to clients in community settings by DHS own analysis, less than 20% of the rates that are based in the new system. And with that reminder, the frozen rate is, that is far short of the wages and benefits needed to provide the services. It provides um, upfront funding, which is the sole purpose of the increase, increase in nursing home wages, caregiver wages. So I thank members for the support, support and hope you would consider supporting this amendment to our, our bill. Thank you, Representative Keel. I believe we were all on, serving on this committee because we care about um, older adults and our most vulnerable and people with disabilities. And we definitely uh, are committed to helping our long-term care facilities. I just want to remind members um, of the resources we provided as a, um, um, from the executive branch, the governor, and how we spend the federal dollars and as uh, legislators, the DFL legislators and others. So in, um, in March of 2020 through September 2021, DHS authorized uh, Section 12A Medicaid emergency funding for nursing facilities. Um, they received requests of 13.2 million from 60 different nursing facilities. So we spent 13.2 million on that piece. 
DHS forgave skilled nursing facilities federal funds based on some CMS feedback, and those offsets cost $45 million um, of a state budget impact. December 2021, DHS authorized $50 million in ARPA funding as emergency grants to all nursing facilities for retention and hiring bonuses. 90% were paid to on-site workers. In January 2022, Medicaid rates, uh, uh, interim rates increased, and this was reflected in the budget forecast. It was equivalent to about $52 million in higher spending. Um, and in January to May of this year, DHS authorized application-based Section 12A Medicaid emergency funds to assist individual facilities with staffing or cash flow emergencies. This was estimated to be 31 million, yet I believe no nursing facilities have yet requested this emergency funding. So we estimate that Minnesota's nursing facilities may have received in excess of 171 million in federal COVID funding assistance since April, 2020. That's 133 million from the provider relief fund and 38 million in COVID quality incentives. Additionally, Minnesota's nursing facilities have received something in the range of 41 million in small business administration loans with the potential for at least an additional 112 million in forgivable loans. And Federal HRSA authorized a phase four round of provider relief funds. So we expect more funding to come and be available to our nursing facilities. And members, um, in our current omnibus bill, we have additional funding for long-term care facilities. Uh, we have recommended 5.5 million in 2023 and 8.2 million in 2024 as a temporary grant program that would support MDH licensed long-term care facilities for improvements to their physical environment and technology and other things to prepare um, for reducing the risk of future transmissions of COVID-19. Um, we have uh, funding that's of 12, over 12.5 million over two years um, for um, um, this program. And we have workforce incentive funding to provide retention incentive bonus payments, loan or tuition reimbursement, payments for childcare costs and transportation costs um, in, this, in this package. We have money for respite care. We increased homemaker rates. Peter and John, uh, stop. Oops, Lindsay, you need to mute. Sorry about that. We have money in for our PACE program, which is Representative Albright's um, bill to avoid nursing facilities, keep people in their homes as long as possible and live independently as much as possible as well. And finally, um, we have evidence from reports on um, the value-based reimbursement system in nursing homes that was passed in 2015, I believe. And we have recent reports that are on our committee website and I believe were circulated via email on the change of ownership in nursing facilities that we have great concerns concerns with which I will refer to those reports and I'm just going to quote a few of uh, the evidence we have looking at whether the value-based reimbursement systems in our nursing facilities um, has been effective in improving quality which was the intent so VBR is a way we pay nursing facilities for their costs and the intent of that legislation was to improve quality of uh, care to the residents and their quality of life and their um, health outcomes. And this is what the reports that were conducted uh, by uh, the University, the um, Purdue and the University of Minnesota discovered about our VBR system. And I believe we get um, these reports every year or every few years on evaluating VBR. But what they found was that um, they quote, the evaluation found no evidence that VBR's quality incentives led to higher facility quality. A stronger threshold is needed for the VBR reimbursement system that would have more impact on facilities. In terms of the change of ownership, we've seen a lot of private equity for-profit firms coming in buying our nursing facilities when VBR was implemented. This is a big concern because change of and ownership of facilities has increased during this VBR period. And facilities that experienced a change in ownership since 2014 are characterized by generally lower quality metrics than their peers. And finally, administrative management fees wow. Excuse me. saw an unusually, this is a quote from the report, large jump, double the usual percentage increase in 2018 while the cluster facilities with lower quality measures had the highest central office and general administrative other costs 
per resident day. There's a separate report on just the change of ownership facilities, and that report found that the CHOW facilities, change of ownership or CHOW, performed worse than facilities with consistent ownership on every quality-related metric. Quality scores and, some com and sub components for instance, quality measures on staffing, retention, community discharge, and hospitalizations. There was a discernible downward trend in quality for, for, for facilities after the change of ownership event. Moreover, the gap in quality scores between chow and non-chow facilities widened after that chow event. Chow facilities reduced spending on laundry and dental benefits while increasing spending more slowly than other facilities on medical and scholarship benefits. They increased administrative management fees at a higher rate than other facilities. So I encourage members to please read through those reports and it's our responsibility to address payments to nursing facilities because I know we all have the goal and the intent that we want to provide the highest level of quality in our long-term care settings. And there is concern across the state that these private equity firms may be damaging the quality of care that's being provided. And this is not just uh, in Minnesota, this is across the country. We have very good research that shows that this is a concern in our state and it's our responsibility to address that. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have some, uh, just in the conversation of funding, I, when we look at all the funding that nursing homes are getting, I think um, we need to really reflect on the fact that they're still suffering. There is still a problem. When you refer to private industry owning nursing homes, um, I don't have a lot of that in my district. And the one that is failing now is owned by the city. And the only reason the city purchased it was because they had to have something when um, uh, the Good Samaritan system moved out of the area. And, and in lack of, of staff, um, I wanna relate a story. I wasn't gonna say anything about this, but I went to church on Sunday, saw a couple of my young ladies home from college. And I said, how's it going? I knew both of them were into nursing. And they said, well, okay, but I have quit the nursing program. And I am hearing from parents the same thing. Why? Because the mandate is that they have to be vaccinated. They have chosen not to be vaccinated, so they're walking away. I have nurses walking away. And, um, and that's true all over the state of Minnesota. So part of our problem is that we, um, we are not even encouraging people to go into this facility or this field because of their concerns about vaccines. Now, I don't want that to be a conversation. That's someone's personal decision. But um, the other thing is, is family have a hard time putting um, be, uh, people in nursing homes because they do not want to be isolated from their families. And so I even have taken my own father to a doctor's appointment and he begged me not to leave him there. They would not allow me to walk in with him, even though they kept asking me if I was a visitor and said, no, I'm his advocate. Um, and we took him out and they weren't even addressing what he needed. But the concern among seniors is that they will not have their family around. And I believe that that's part of our numbers for why the nursing homes do not have the numbers they need or can use. And people need that service. We have certainly um, letting, letting um, seniors stay in their homes as long as possible is important. But the other thing that is really important to understand is it's not always possible to take care of family members in a home setting. Their houses are older, there's steps, there's all kinds of issues and, and or their physical needs that have to be happen. And that's the other concern. Our nursing homes are having to use much higher care of, of services because that's who they have. It isn't the multitude of different types of services they're delivering to each, you know, each person that is there. So, um, uh, we're having higher needs and, and it's really important. And then Madam uh, 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 Chair, I would really ask that we do a roll call on this vote, on this amendment. Thank you, Representative Keel. Roll call has been requested on the amendment vote. Thank you, Representative Keel. I know that many, most of our nursing homes are providing excellent care in the state and they're still struggling. This is true. 
but we want to make sure that um, that money going to, for instance, the private equity controlled nursing facilities, we want to make sure that those investments are being used to care and providing the highest quality of care to those residents. And my concern, and it's shared among others, is that that money is leaving the nursing facility, not going towards higher wages or to improve quality for those private equity controlled nursing facilities for some of them. I mean, we have some bad actors and we wanna make sure that the money, the state dollars we do spend is used for the residents, for the wages, to provide the best level of care and quality that we can get. I think we all agree on that. So we just have to, our job is to make sure that that it can happen, that that is happening. And so I, I you know, I hope that um, members can work on this issue and use the evidence we have, the scientific evidence of this research, the investigations, the reporting to improve our VBR system. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of closing comments. Um, you know, one of the things that I've observed uh, in, the, in the, the comments about this amendment, one is we are doing uh, uh, a, a broad cross-section in a number of initiatives uh, to provide for our nursing homes. But Madam Chair, that being said, it's clearly not enough if you're not able to retain qualified staff while we are also witnessing the closing of facilities or sadly, the denial of those same residents from accepting new residents. So something is, is going on here. Um, and and on, a, on, a, on a professional note, Madam Chair, uh, I've heard it said in a, a couple of comments uh, on this amendment and the one previous, um, Please don't vilify private equity. Um, that is the marketplace trying to uh, insert real capital into real instances where it is really needful to support and to sustain th those very uh, establishments that would be going out of business if private equity firms would not insert their own capital at their own risk, particularly in light of what we just got done talking about with low reimbursement rates and with a shortage of staff. So please, the private equity firms that you speak of are not the villains here. This is a systemic issue. And I will leave you with this. We have more people age 65 and older now than we have in the K-12 system and it is only going to be exacerbated in the years to come. So clearly we are not funding these substantially enough to take care of the very people that we say that we're wanting to take care of. And so I would urge members to support the Keel Amendment and improve the, the, the product that we are going to move out of this committee today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Albright. And I really do hear the passion in your voice, which makes me optimistic that we can all work together on this. You know, as an economist, I understand the value of private equity. I also understand that there's a profit motive that they need to earn a rate of return. And I'm not, I think we can all acknowledge that that is true. Um, and you know that not all private equity firms are, um, are have that goal. They may want to have a mission of making sure we have nursing facilities open and operating across the state. Um, but I think we also have to be um, realistic about what some of those goals are and, um, and just uh, monitor uh, what is happening in our nursing facilities. Um, but with that, members, we are running out of time. So I'm going to go to Representative Keel for closing comments on her amendment, and then we'll do the roll call vote. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I urge you all to reconsider and support this, this amendment. I think it is vitally important, as I've expressed earlier. Um, uh, Chair uh, Schultz, you mentioned that we want this to go to the workers. This is absolutely what this bill does. It goes to the workers. It confirms that people, whether you're um, washing dishes, cleaning floors, 
providing food, all of those services are very important. And, and someone cleaning a room is important to that resident. They see things, they talk to them, they have relationships with them also. I see them at funerals because they've had a relationship with a, with a resident. Um, so this is really, really important that we help all of those people that work within that um, system of care and, um, and would encourage a, uh, a yes vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Keel. Um, this is not a vote against workers. This is a no vote on an amendment that makes changes to a bill. And I am committed to making sure that all of our caring professionals are getting a living wage, that they're getting adequate benefits. And our caucus has brought forward many, many bills to do that across the industries. I'll just remind members that the VBR system is set up so that the nursing facilities are reimbursed their costs. So they can increase wages and they will get reimbursed their costs. So with that members, I'm, I urge a no vote on this amendment and I hope we can all work together on and um, support our other bills as well to increase wages for our frontline workers. So Ms. Hansen, please prepare to take the roll. The chair votes no. Schultz, no. Vice Chair Bonner. Fortunately, no. Bonner, no. Lead Albright. Albright, aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, no. Bolden, no. Representative Burkle. Burkle, aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, no. Fisher, no. Representative Frederick. No. Frederick, no. Representative Hansen. Hanson, no. Hanson, no. Representative Keel? Keel, aye. Keel, aye. Thank you. Representative Liebling? Liebling, no. Liebling, no. Representative Moeller? Moeller, no. Moeller, no. Representative Noor? No, no. Noor, no. Representative Novotny? Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. Representative Pearson? Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Representative Pinto? No. Pinto, no. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, aye. Rasmussen, aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Robbins, aye. Representative Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Thank you, members. And sorry about before my children are home today. <laughs> um, Chair Schultz, that's 11, no. I'm sorry, eight ayes and 11 nays. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Um, do, um, do not apologize for children making noises in the background. That's fine. So members, the motion does not um, prevail and the amendment is not adopted. We have one more amendment to the uh, um, DE and that is amendment A6. Representative Rasmussen, would you like to move the A6 amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would move the A6 amendment. Hey, Representative Rasmussen moves the A6 amendment. Please describe your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. The A6 amendment would attach House File 2818, which we heard in this committee earlier this session, and I appreciate Chair Schultz giving uh, this bill a hearing. Th this provision would allow Pioneer Care Nursing Home in Fergus Falls to access the new property uh, payment system, which more fairly compensates nursing homes that have made large property investments that improve the experience uh, for staff and residents. Um, for, for members who may not remember, the new uh, property payment system was put in place in 2019. From that time on, any new projects approved through a moratorium exception get the new property rate system. Uh, and without this bill, Pioneer Care would need to seek a new project through the moratorium exception to get access to the new property rate system. Uh, because Pioneer's nursing home was built brand new in 2010, there isn't necessarily a need to make any additional capital investments at this time. And looking at the lifespan of their facility, they're basically in a brand new building. So the moratorium exception process is not an appropriate answer uh, for Pioneer Care's unique situation. And for those reasons, uh, Madam Chair members, through this amendment and, and the bill, uh, we're seeking a limited legislative solution. And so would ask for uh, and appreciate members' support of the A6 amendment. 
Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. I, Rasmussen, I really appreciate that you're championing a facility in your district. Um, I just have a question, Representative Rasmussen. Is this bill, did this bill move in the Senate and is it in Senator Abler's omnibus bill? Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Um, I would have to go and, and look at the latest version of the bill um, to see, um, but I, I know that uh, Senator Ingebretson is championing it in the Senate. And has it had a committee hearing in the Senate, Representative Rasmussen? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would have to uh, follow up with the Senate author. Okay, thank you. Please do so and let me know. But for at this time, members, um, I'm going to be voting down this amendment and um, we will work with the Senate um, and Representative Rasmussen in the future to, see, to talk about the property value issue. And I know DHS is also working on this issue and it affects probably more than just Representative Rasmussen's facility. So it would, I prefer to do so, a global solution um, that hopefully we can work on in conference committee. So I urge members to vote no on this amendment. Representative, is, I don't believe there was a roll call vote. So we will um, do a voice vote. All those in favor of the A, the A6 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. 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 The um, motion does not prevail and the A6 amendment is not adopted. Okay, members. Uh, the next, uh, so that is that we are finished with um, amendments to the um, DE. My motion, I'm gonna next move to amend the vehicle, House File 4579 with the DE A22-0415 as amended. This is a voice vote. All I'm those sure. in favor? Representative, sure Albright, hand, Representative right. Albright, sorry. Representative Thank you, Albright. Madam Chair. I would move a roll call on the adoption of the DE. Thank you. Roll call having been requested, we'll do a roll call. Ms. Hansen, please prepare a roll call vote. Certainly. Chair Schultz? The chair votes aye. Vice Chair Bonner? Aye. Lead Albright? Albright votes no. Albright, no. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, no. Burkle, no. Representative Fisher. Uh, Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, no. Keel, no. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Muller. Muller, aye. Muller, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny? Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Pearson? Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen, no. Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins? No. Robbins, no. Representative Sandell? Aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Thank you, sir. Oh, Chair Schultz, that's 11 ayes and 8 nays. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. The motion prevails and the DE amendment as the DE as amended is adopted on House File 4579. So the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, members. Um, uh, finally, I'm going to make the motion. So I move to re-refer. House file 4579 as amended and recommend it to be re-referred to Ways and Means. And I will add that the nonpartisan staff is directed to make any technical changes or corrections as needed. This will be a roll call and the chair votes aye. Votes aye. Vice Chair Bonner? Aye. Bonner, aye. Lead Albright? Albright, no. Albright, no. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle, no. Burkle, no. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Hansen. Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Keel. Keel, no. Keel, no. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Moeller. Moeller, aye. Muller, I. Representative Noor. Noor, I. Noor, I. Representative Novotny. Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Pearson. Pearson, no. Pearson, no. Representative Pinto. 
Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen, no. Rasmussen, no. Representative Robbins. No. Robbins, no. Representative Sandell. Sandell, yes. Aye. Thank you, sir. Sandell, yes. And Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Chair Schultz, that's 11 ayes and 8 nays. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. The motion prevails in House File 4579 as amended and recommended to Ways and Means and the direction to nonpartisan staff to make any technical changes or corrections as needed. The motion prevails. House File 4579 as amended and recommended is on its way to Ways and Means. Members, this could potentially be our last committee hearing of the session. I want to thank everyone for all the hard work they're doing. I also want to thank everyone for um, getting through this, this, this year in a short year, short session. We've done amazing work on working and to spend the surplus um, on needed investments in human services and also doing the work um, for the people, for the people that may not have a loud voice at the Capitol, but have, have needs that need to be met. Um, I wanna thank everyone um, for working together and in a civil way uh, this year. Um, I also want to remind the public and our advocates and lobbyists to, um, if you have concerns about this bill or comments or suggestions to please um, send those to me via email. Our staff do need a few days of rest. So I encourage you to just uh, talk directly with me about concerns and maybe provide some rest um, for our, our staff who have worked very long hours in crafting this, these bills and making sure um, we're doing the best work we can here at the Capitol. Vice Chair Bonner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the indulgence. And um, I just wanted to say uh, briefly, uh, Chair, the chair covered very so much of this, but I really want to thank um, Chair Schultz for her excellent leadership, and and we will certainly miss her um, as she moves on to her next steps, and to the staff, and and of course even the members here today. I think during testimony, it's very clear that the issues we address in this committee can be heart wrenching and difficult and fraught with. Um, challenges and nuance and complexity. And I appreciate that all of our members uh, bring such sensitivity to the issue. Um, so thank you for all of your hard work and thank you to Chair Schultz uh, for your leadership as well. Thank you, Chair Vice Chair Bonner. We appreciate your help as well this session. Um, as I was called away to do other things, thank you for taking the gavel and look forward to see what you will be doing um, next year in committee. Uh, Lead Albright. Uh, Chair Schultz, uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank you for um, presiding over this committee over uh, the last several months. Uh, you have been diligent. You have uh, persevered through some difficult times, both technological and otherwise. Uh, so I would uh, just uh, personally uh, tip my hat to you and thank you for uh, providing that leadership. Um, it, it probably goes without saying that uh, both sides of the aisle come at uh, these issues uh, from different perspectives. Um, but I hope that our genuineness in terms of providing uh, that observation and those uh, uh, comments uh, serve a, a greater purpose in terms of uh, providing a better uh, outcome uh, for the committee and the work product that we produce and bring forward to the larger body in the, on the floor of the house. So uh, again, as has been said before, uh, my personal thanks to both uh, nonpartisan and partisan staff and, and to all those who have advocated for their uh, constituents on behalf of, of the bills and the initiatives in this uh, final omnibus bill. Uh, we wish them the best and we wish uh, rest for those that uh, need it the most as we uh, move forward through the rest of the session. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, best of luck to you in your endeavors. I want to thank you, Representative Albright. It's been a pleasure serving with you, and I am so grat I have so much gratitude to you for being um, a lead on this committee and for all the work you've done over time, and I'm excited about um, the provisions that you have included in this bill, the PACE provisions, and I hope that will be successful as well as we roll that out um, 
in future years. You know, in my eight years here at the legislature, I've been in divided government and we have been able to do incredible work. And so, you know, I'm just, I, I wish the, the federal level, they could take uh, lessons from the Minnesota legislature and how we work across the aisle and really with all parties, because it's not just Republicans and Democrats. We have new Republicans, we have independents, independents, and we really do work together. And um, I think going forward, we need to make a greater effort to unify our state and our country and show the country how we can work, even though we have different opinions. Um, and we have different, some different ideology, but ultimately I hope that we all share the same values. And in this committee, it is valuing people and is investing in people. And it is making sure that they have the opportunities and the resources they need to lead very full, high quality lives. And so I wanna thank everybody. And um, I know this day, I know that we have a legislative break coming up and I'm not sure, I know I have another committee hearing, others may as well, but um, we will continue to do this important work. And I'm looking forward to working with my counterpart, Representative Abler in the Senate, or Senator Abler, former representative, um, and working with Chair Liebling and the HHS team in the House and uh, our counterparts in the Senate to produce another historic health and human services package for the people across our state. And with that, members, um, we are adjourned and I hope to see everybody on the floor at 12. Bye-bye.